Hey, Justin, how are you? Hey, long time. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, how have you been in the last 15 minutes? <laughs> um, Sorting um, through tips for our next story, actually. So it's, it's excellent. Gonna... Maybe we'll get some uh, uh, from the uh, viewers and listeners here today. I, I feel like we're here. Know, we go back a, a long way. Um, we uh, once wrote a story about antitrust economics um, and the consumer welfare standard. I feel like we didn't get to do a uh, IG uh, live event for that. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, we're, we're here to talk about the submarine and the Titanic, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we got to <laughs> finally have right. something that was popular. I, I, I don't know. I think the, uh, this stuff has rivaled the popularity of that. So, um, so why, uh, I'm Jesse Isinger, I guess I should have introduced myself. Um, I'm a longtime ProPublica uh, reporter, now an editor, uh, senior editor. Uh, Justin is a, a reporter, he reports um, on uh, democracy issues in the judiciary. Um, you've been doing this all year, uh, did a big series of stories on Justice Clarence Thomas with uh, your colleagues and my colleagues, Josh Kaplan and Alex Majerzewski. And um, why don't you summarize a little bit more, uh, Alexis already uh, gave a little bit um, of a summary, but why don't you expand a little bit on the latest story on uh, Justice Samuel Alito? Sure, so the basic outlines of the story are that uh, back in 2008, Justice Alito uh, took a lavish fishing like vacation to Alaska that he didn't pay uh, a cent for, as we understand it. Um, he was flown to Alaska on a private jet by uh, Paul Singer, who's a hedge fund billionaire and uh, important donor to Republican and conservative legal causes. Um, Justice Alito, uh, you know, did also did not pay for a stay at the fishing lodge, which is owned by another donor. Um, and importantly, he did not disclose uh, the gifts of this flight or the stay at the lodge on his annual financial disclosure, which is the one of the few kind of instruments of transparency that we have or are supposed to have for Supreme Court justices. And then uh, in the years that followed, starting a, about a year, year and a half later, um, Singer's hedge funds start to have cases at the court um, as part of uh, this long running and very high stakes litigation they had with the nation of Argentina. We can talk more about that if people want, but the kind of relevant fact is that Justice Alito did not recuse himself from any of these cases, even though uh, he'd, he'd taken this expensive gift of a private jet flight from Singer. Um, and in the, in the one case the court did hear and rule on, um, Alito voted in the majority for Singer. Um, and, you know, we can talk more about Justice Alito's response, but he has basically said that he didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get into his response in a second, but I just want to outline um, this. So there are two uh, aspects of this that were um, troubling. One was the issue of the lack of disclosure, and then the other was the issue of uh, the lack of recusal, failure to recuse. Um, what did ethics experts tell us about both of those? Yeah, so the, the disclosure question, uh, according to everyone we talked to, is a, a real kind of open and shut case. Uh, but, you know, there's a law, it was passed after Watergate, that requires Supreme Court justices to disclose most gifts they get. Um, there are some carve outs uh, related to personal hospitality, but everyone we talked about this, I think we've now talked to probably eight ethics lawyers, uh, said that um, you have to disclose gifts of private jet trips. They're not uh, not covered by any exemption. And these are quite expensive. You know, I, uh, I've never had the privilege of flying private but um, we have been talking to a lot of uh, uh, j private jet charter companies to get a sense of the prices. And, you know, this, this flight from the East Coast to Alaska, just one way, one leg of it, we were told, uh, could e easily, the cost could easily ex exceed $100,000 for, for the charter. Um, so, you know, depending on how you slice it, this is a, a gift worth tens and tens of thousands of dollars 
to Justice Alito. So that's the disclosure uh, part. He should have disclosed it and didn't. Uh, and the one other thing about that is we, we have and we link in the story to uh, uh, several other federal judges who have disclosed gifts of private jet flights. Um, the recusal is kind of a, a, a slightly more, more um, fuzzy question. Uh, there, there is also a law that uh, says justices have to recuse themselves when uh, a reasonable person uh, would uh, would look at the situation and, and see either impropriety or the or the appearance of impropriety. Um, but the decision on whether to recuse is left entirely up to the justices themselves, each justice, um, and it's not appealable. Uh, but the experts we talked to um, and quoted in the story said that, look, it's, it's not even a close call. If you got a gift from one of the litigants, uh, of course you should recuse yourself. And I think the most convincing argument that one of these recusal experts made to us was like, look, imagine if you were suing somebody uh, in court and you found out that the person on the other side of your case had been flying the, the judge around on a private jet and, and vacationing with them, how would you feel about that? Uh, and if the answer to that is, you know, I probably wouldn't feel very good about it, I'd probably want a different judge, then the judge should recuse themselves. Uh, if, if you knew, uh, one of these experts, uh, I thought you guys got a great quote saying, um, if uh, he was a good friend of yours, why didn't you recuse? If he wasn't a good friend of yours, why did you take this gift? Uh, and I think that sort of succinctly uh, sums up the findings of the story. Uh, now, there have been some questions uh, uh, that people have dared to ask about um, our sources and uh, these legal experts. Um, and um, so let, are we uh, just culling um, the ranks of uh, Antifa um, for the legal experts, um, uh, left wing uh, uh, organizations that uh, want to tear down um, the judiciary and all that sacred? What, who are these experts? Right. They either, they either have to have uh, Antifa credentials or uh, in some cases, the Revolutionary Communist Party would also be acceptable. No, but yeah. I. Uh, more, no, that's a joke, to be clear. Uh, the people that we've quoted, no and I encourage okay. anyone, yes, <laughs> I encourage, if, if, if you are interested in this, I, you should look at their resumes, they're, they're all easily findable on their websites. Uh, these are, you know, some of the leading ethics, uh, ju judicial ethics experts in the country, people who have, uh, in many cases, worked for administrations of both parties, published uh, respected books on, you know, the issues we're quoting them on. I mean, to give one example, uh, the first person we quote in, in the story, uh, he was actually the person who made the comment you just um, read, Jesse, about why, uh, if, you know, if he's your friend, you should be recusing yourself. And if he's not your friend, why are you taking this expensive private jet flight from him? Um, that quote came from a, a, a law professor named uh, Charlie Jay. Um, and uh, this is not a partisan guy. He has a long record of being quoted uh, and being involved in criticizing, um, you know, people for ethical violations uh, on, from across the political spectrum. And I think most relevantly, he actually wrote the leading treatise on judicial recusals uh, that was actually published by the, uh, by the U.S. federal judiciary itself. Um, which you can look up. Uh, it's a very, um, it's a very thorough read. I think it goes on for about 200 pages about when all the examples of when judges have recused themselves and what the considerations should be. Um, so this is not somebody that's a partisan that would, uh, you know, frankly, I don't think he cares uh, what the party uh, of, of the judges that, that, you know, he's being asked to comment on. He was very careful to try to understand the facts and um, you know, give a sober, thoughtful response to our questions. Yeah. Um, and we've quoted uh, Republicans, we've quoted people who've worked in Republican administrations or been appointed by Republican judges. Um, uh, we've spoken to Republican judges, uh, you know, or judges who were appointed by Republicans as well. Um, uh, and I'm not aware of any uh, expert with relevant legal ethics uh, experience who's actually um, defended this behavior from Thomas or from uh, Alito. 
Um, now, uh, Alito did defend himself, um, uh, which led to a, an exciting Tuesday evening for us. Um, uh, can you sort of recount how this all went down? Um, because we published very late on uh, Tuesday night, I believe. Yeah, so last week uh, we did sort of what we always do when we're um, getting uh, closer, when we think we're getting closer to publishing a story, which is we reached out to the subjects of the story, including Justice Alito, through the Supreme Court press office. And uh, we sent a, a long um, list of questions and an interview request, uh, basically laying out um, sort of in question form everything that we were considering putting in the story, which had not actually uh, which was not actually fully written yet. Um, and, you know, uh, we call this the, the no surprises process. And the idea is that, you know, we're reaching out in, in good faith to get the person's comments. Sometimes, sometimes during our reporting, uh, our sources get things wrong. Um, and we want uh, the subjects of the stories to tell us that so we can consider their evidence, consider their point of view, and adjust our story accordingly, bef uh, you know, before putting it out in the world. You know, we take things out of stories all the time uh, as, you know, because of this process, change, change what's in stories, you know, occasionally kill stories altogether. Um, so our deadline was, was this, this week, Tuesday. Um, my reporting partner, uh, Josh Kaplan, and I got on the phone uh, on around midday Tuesday with the spokeswoman for the Supreme Court, um, Patricia McCabe, who told us that uh, Justice Alito would not be responding. Um, she, uh, you know, asked us uh, about the timing of publication and, you know, sort of as a courtesy, we told her, uh, well, we're definitely not going to publish today, which was Tuesday, but could be tomorrow, Wednesday, more likely Thursday. We don't actually have a specific date yet. And she said, um, okay, uh, so you're sure that you're not publishing today? And we said, that's right. Then uh, about six hours later, um, one of us looked, opened up uh, Twitter or the internet and saw that the Wall Street Journal had published a, a extremely unusual, probably unprecedented op-ed piece by Justice Alito himself with the headline, uh, ProPublica misleads its readers, um, attacking us for this story that had not been published yet. Um, and so then we uh, decided yeah. that we should probably put the story out so people could see how we were misleading them. Um, and we ended uh, it, up publishing about six hours later. It's hard to, to mislead readers uh, um, with no words to mislead them. Um, so uh, that was that was unusual. That was exciting. Um, we worked uh, hard and quickly to uh, finish up the story. Let's let's summarize what Alito's arguments were, because um, uh, essentially he said, "No, I didn't have to recuse, and no, I didn't have to disclose." Um, wh why is he? What's what's the basis for those two contentions? Sure. So on the uh, disclosure question, uh, whether he should have disclosed the gift of this private jet flight and the stay at the at the at the luxury fishing lodge, um, he quoted from uh, and this gets a little bit in the weeds the uh, the filing instructions for the justices annual financial disclosure. So there's these forms that you can go look up that are public in which the justices lay out, and many other public officials, federal officials, lay out uh, how much money they made from selling stocks and outside income. Uh, and then there's an important section about gifts that they've received. Um, and Justice Alito's argument is that the filing instructions said uh, that he did not have to disclose gifts that were, quote unquote, personal hospitality, because personal hospitality, according to him, was carved out of the uh, requirement to disclose gifts. Um, now, what That's he didn't mention true, at all, but kind yes, of not right. What and and so the what he did not mention, uh, which was somewhat surprising, especially given that he's in the business of uh, statutory interpretation, is that there is actually a law here, uh, which we link to in our story. It's called the Ethics and Government Act, and 
Uh, he did not mention the text of this law, which says, which is pretty clear, even if you're not a lawyer. Uh, it says that you have to disclose gifts, um, but you don't have to disclose uh, food, lodging, or entertainment that is extended to you as personal hospitality. Now, if you notice, um, transportation, private jet flight, is not would not be included in any, uh, you know, I think in anyone's understanding of, of, of food, lodging, or entertainment. Um, Justice Alito did not mention that this is what the law says. He actually didn't mention the law, period. And instead, uh, only referred to these filing instructions um, and, and then made a uh, kind of ran with the filing instructions and said that uh, I don't have to disclose private jet flights because um, they could be considered a facility, which is a, a, another word used in a different part of the law. It was very confusing. Um, and again, uh, as I said earlier, none of the ethics law experts we've talked to agree with this. And there are uh, many other federal judges who actually have reported gifts of private jet flights. So that's the disclosure piece. Yeah, I, uh, I I think everybody's familiar with uh, saying I gotta wait, gotta leave uh, early tonight because I gotta wake up early in the morning to take a facility out of JFK. Um, uh, classic uh, English locution there. Um, the um, uh, and you know so the the question is, you know, the the omission there was to not cite the law, which was um, odd, and then. Uh, go into some calisthenics uh, about the definition. What about the recusal issue? Yeah, so the recusal issue, um, he said uh, a couple things. One is he said, um, first of all, uh, all of these cases that Paul Singer's hedge fund had the court, um, Justice Alito said, I didn't know Paul Singer had anything to do with these cases because they didn't say, the, the case title was not Paul Singer versus uh, the Republic of Argentina, the case title was uh, NML Capital, which was an arm of Singer's hedge fund versus the Republic of Argentina. Um, and if you haven't, if you're not steeped in this, uh, it's true that NML Capital sounds a little obscure, but it turns out that this uh, decade long legal battle between Singer's hedge fund and Argentina was you know, on the front pages of business sections and, 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 you know, just newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you know, around the world really for years. Uh, there, was a, a, there was a major uh, international incident in which, uh, back in 2012, in which Singer's hedge fund actually tried to seize uh, an Argentine Navy ship um, that was docked off the coast of Ghana. And, uh, and the, the, uh, a UN, a United Nations court uh, called the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea ended up having to get involved. And this was like a major international story. Paul Singer was extremely closely and publicly uh, linked to this case. Um, but Justice, Justice Alito says, and there's not really any way to fact check this in, inside his head, that he didn't know that. So that was, and, and therefore, he, how could he, why would he recuse himself when he didn't even know there was this connection to Singer? And then he goes on to say, uh, well, even if I had known, um, I wouldn't have recused myself because I barely know Paul Singer. I've only, sure, I took this trip with him, but I've only talked to him a few times. And uh, this private jet flight he gave me, um, all I was doing was occupying an empty seat that otherwise would have gone to waste. <laughs> um, and so it didn't cost anything, anything to Singer. Um, and so therefore, no reasonable person could, uh, you know, believe there's any question or appearance of, of impropriety here, which again, um, the recusal uh, experts we spoke to uh, vociferously disagreed with said, you know, if you're getting something of immense value from a litigant, it's just a no brainer, you can't be on the case. Uh, as many people have said, try that the next time you're on a Delta facility, that is. Uh, uh, I'd like to sit in that empty uh, first class seat. Um, probably not going to be able to uh, convince them. Um, that that Ghana uh, ship incident was so well known, I, I think I'll get in trouble for um, revealing that my wife told me uh, it was a plot point on uh, Madam Secretary. Um, uh, so uh, so people, people knew about this. Um, uh, all right. So 
Including, by, including, including, by the way, in the Wall Street Journal itself, the Wall Street Journal editorial and page. And the Wall Street uh, Journal editorial page. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. A, uh, a, a page that we know that uh, Sam Alito has some familiarity with. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about this guy, Paul Singer. Um, he's obviously an extraordinarily important figure. Um, let, explain a little bit about his business and where he sits in the firmament of conservative politics, because he's an important figure in both arenas. Yeah, so in terms of his business, um, so his hedge fund is called Elliott Management, uh, no relation to me, sadly, for my financial affairs. Um, no private jets for you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, uh, it's, you know, I, you, you probably know it better than I do, Jesse, but as I understand it, it's been, you know, one of the most successful hedge funds of the last half century. I think they have annual, annualized returns going back to the 70s of 9% a year or something like that. Very, very consistent high returns that has made Paul Singer one of the top few hundred richest people in the country, if you believe uh, the Forbes list. Um, so he's a very wealthy guy. And what the hedge fund is specifically known for, they do a lot of things, but what they're best known for are making investments that are not passive, but are uh, in which they play an active role and in, that often involve uh, high stakes litigation. Um, the best example is this Argentina saga, which, which parenthetically, um, Singer's hedge fund prevailed ultimately in part because of you know, a series of these Supreme Court rulings. Um, they ultimately walked away uh, with a payout of over $2 billion from Argentina uh, after like 13 years of, of litigation. Um, but they've also been involved in, um, you know, a series of other high profile lawsuits. Uh, they often get, um, are, uh, they often involve corporate bankruptcies, uh, trying to shake up the management of, of public companies, getting on the boards of companies. Um, right now they're involved in a, a, a really high profile lawsuit in which they're actually suing the uh, London Metal Exchange over um, uh, some <laughs> o over the the exchange canceling a bunch of trades in nickel uh, after the market kind of went haywire a couple of years ago, um, and that again has you know is on like the front page of the Financial Times. So they're very big. Um, uh, you know, many of their investments or their best known investments involve litigation. Um, Singer himself went to law school, was, was an attorney uh, for a few years. Um, they hired the best lawyers. The Argentina case, um, they had Ted Olson, the appellate lawyer who uh, represented George Bush in Bush v. Gore. Um, and so uh, it's not surprising that he has had, you know, more than 10 matters at the Supreme Court. Now, at the same time as his business has been thriving, um, he's also become one of the biggest Republican donors in the country, uh, you know, just the donations that we know about are easily over hundred million dollars. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty clear there's also a lot of undisclosed donations. Uh, we know that he's been a major donor to the Federalist Society. Uh, we can't put a number on it, but he's a big donor to the Federalist Society, um, which is, you know, this conservative uh, legal group. Um, and that sort of connects to does connect to somebody else that was on this fishing trip, uh, Leonard Leo, the, the longtime Federal Society executive, who yeah, seemed to be the kind get of to Leo person in connecting second, it together. Yeah, because uh, he's important. But yeah, keep keep on Singer because um, I I think the important thing here is that Singer we're not in his head. We don't really know, but um, he's articulated his views um, on both politics and investing. And he's got a po uh, political view and a view of what the courts should do. But uh, also, it's crucial to his business model um, what the courts do. Um, it, it's a crucial element um, of how he makes money, which is to invest and then try to shape the outcomes through litigation. Um, uh, I think that's a very important thing that there's a nice confluence here between the ideology and uh, the uh, and the business. Right. I mean, when you know, when we wrote about Clarence Thomas and his uh, billionaire benefactor Harlan Crow, 
I mean, I don't, I don't know that we know the full picture there yet, but one thing that's pretty clear is that Crowe has not consistently had actual cases as a litigant before the court. Crow uh, has all kinds of ideological interests related to the court as an important funder of groups that are filing amicus briefs and are trying to shape the law. Um, but with Singer, it's really a step further, several steps further than that, where he has extremely clear uh, material interests uh, before the court regularly. In fact, right now, as we speak, um, his hedge fund, again, is a party uh, to a petition asking uh, the Supreme Court to take a case as part of a, a new legal dispute they're in. And the court has said they're going to be looking at that, I believe, this coming September. Uh, Justice Alito has not said whether he's going to recuse himself. I assume he's not going to. But yeah, um, yeah that, we have a whole timeline in the story of just repeated cases. Um, and uh, going back to Thomas, uh, Thomas, of course, said it was okay to take flights from Crow because they were uh, dear family friends. Um, Alito says it's okay to take a flight because he uh, barely knew Singer. Um, uh, and it's so not worth anything. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, so uh, we've, you mentioned Leonard Leo. Why don't you explain that? Then we'll get to some audience questions in a second. But um, Leo is a, uh, who's Leonard Leo? Seems like a very important figure in this uh, whole story. Yeah, so Leonard Leo is uh, also an attorney, but was never, never a practicing attorney, as I understand it. But he, for, for many years, was uh, one of the top executives at the Federalist Society. And the Federalist Society is um, this uh, conservative legal organization that does a number of different things, some of which are just, uh, you know, um, every law school have a, a Federalist Society student chapter where kind of like-minded law students can meet and hang out and uh you know network and sponsor panel discussions that you know they'll, uh but kind of more importantly for uh for our politics um the, the federal society and in particularly leo in particular leo um over the last 15 or 20 years especially has played a, a really important role in creating the conservative supermajority on the supreme court so going back to the uh, nominations and confirmations of, of John Roberts and Alito in the second, uh, second George W. Bush term. Um, Leo was, uh, played an important role in um, organizing outside support, running ad campaigns for Alito, uh, you know, do, doing research, uh, doing oppo research, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of having a whole media strategy and then in the years since that, his profile has grown to, um, you know, I think kind of culminating in the Trump administration when he uh, famously played an important role uh, writing, uh, drafting the list that Trump released of his potential Supreme Court picks uh, during the primary when Trump was still trying to uh, court the uh, various um, uh, various segments of the Republican base and kind of prove that he would uh, appoint the types of judges that they wanted him to appoint. So Leo, uh, you know, helped write that list of judges. And then, you know, fast forward to um, a year or two ago, uh, we, along with the New York Times, broke the story that Leo, that Leo received um, by far the single biggest political donation in history uh, $1.6 billion, so $1,600,000,000 million, um, for a new group called the Marble Freedom Trust uh, that, you know, we're not totally sure how, what's, uh, how it's going to deploy all that money yet, but to sort of generally advance its political interests with respect to not just the law, but kind of U.S. politics more generally. So he uh, is, you know, I think it's fair to say one of the most powerful pe unelected people in U.S. politics right now. Yeah. And um, now he called up uh, Singer and um, said, uh, hey, uh, we're going to Alaska. Can you take me on your plane and can you take uh, Sam Alito? Um, right. Uh, right. Which you, you and Josh and Alex reported. Uh, OK, so uh, let me take some questions from the, um, uh, the audience. Um, one, one is, 
uh, kind of explaining a little bit of the magic of the reporting. I, I, and I do think that the reporting has been dazzling here, um, full of uh, extraordinary detail. Um, the kinds of people you've been talking to um, are really kind of imaginative and remarkable. Why, why don't you sort of walk us through a little bit about the genesis of this and how you guys have found the people you found to get you to talk, get them <laughs> and how you've gotten them to talk. Uh, I would like to take lessons because I used to think I was a pretty good reporter until I started editing this series. Yeah, so obviously there, there's some things we we still can't talk about because a lot of our sources are are not named in this in the story, and we um, you know have have to keep keep folks anonymous who need to be anonymous. But the um, you know uh, c contrary to what some people have accused us of. Um, when we started this reporting, we actually had no idea we were, we were going to write about the Supreme Court, let alone uh, Justice Al Justices Alito and Thomas. Um, about six months ago, Josh and I were thinking about uh, covering the judiciary more broadly, looking at the appellate courts, which we still find really interesting, state Supreme Courts. Um, and we initially thought, well, the Supreme Court uh, seems like it's probably the best covered court in the judiciary, so we should look elsewhere. Um, but the, the genesis of this story actually was um, we noticed that uh, Justice Scalia, who died, of course, six or seven years ago, um, his papers are now at Harvard Law School, and most of them are sealed for several decades. But for reasons that are still not clear, the photographs are, are open for, to the public. So we went up there, um, and we knew that, that Justice Scalia had died uh, while on this kind of exclusive hunting ranch in Texas owned by a businessman. And he had a reputation for taking these hunting trips. Um, and we were curious to learn more about that. And we found all these photos of, of Justice uh, Scalia uh, hunting and fishing um, with all kinds of interesting seeming people, some of whom we actually recognized. And um, one of those trips that Justice Scalia took, uh, we actually wrote about in the same story this week was to Alaska, um, sponsored by, paid for by the same businessman who uh, owned the fishing lodge that Justice Alito went to uh, in 2008. And so um, w once we started kind of poking around on this fishing trip, uh, we you know, found out about this trip that Justice Alito had taken. Um, we started uh, trying to talk to everyone we could who was involved in this, like fishing guides, um, at the lodge, private jet pilots uh, at the lodge, um, you know, getting uh, flight records from the government that sort of allow you to sketch out to some extent private jet, uh, the, the routes of private jets. Um, and we ended up, uh, you know, and what we told people, um, everyone we talked talk to, uh, you know, we, we told them what we were working on, that we were that, that, you know, this aspect of the justices' lives was not well understood. They were traveling with some people who seemed really interesting, uh, you know, powerful political players, uh, billionaire businessmen. Um, it's, it seems to us obvious that it's in the public interest that should be in the public domain when billionaires are getting private access to justices by financing their, you know, extracurricular vacations. We would do that story, uh, you know, in a minute if we heard about it with a senator or president. Um, and uh, so we you know, started talking to people and it kind of just snowballed from there. And um, uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and of course, we would do that story in a minute uh, if it involved a judge or justice who was appointed by a Democrat. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, we welcome tips um, about uh, all judges uh, and justices and gifts that they may be receiving or uh, anything that they, um, you know, their financial arrangements that are undisclosed, um, uh, whether they're, whether it's about uh, an appointee uh, from a Democratic um, uh, president or a Republican. Um, that, that's, Absolutely. Uh, our, our our contact info is at the bottom of the story if anyone out there uh, has ideas for us. Absolutely. And, um, and the tips have been great on this series, haven't they? Um, uh, yeah. Well, you know, this particular story, uh, as you know, Jesse, we, um, we, we 
were working on originally earlier, earlier this year, and we had to put it on the back burner for a while because uh, after the first story on uh, Justice Thomas and Harlan Crow came out, uh, we got so many tips, we had to spend a month writing follow-up stories about, uh, you know, we learned about Harlan Crow doing a real estate deal with Clarence Thomas, Harlan Crow being the landlord of Clarence Thomas's mother, but apparently not charging her rent, uh, Harlan Crow paying the private school tuition for uh, Clarence Thomas's relative who he was raising as a son. Um, so those were those stories, uh, second and third stories, as we've said, came because people out there, uh, you know, if you if you see something, say something principle, uh, uh, heard something and, and picked up the phone or shot us an email. And it's usually they don't come fully kind of gift wrapped. And it's just kind of a uh, one piece of a puzzle. But that's that really helps a lot for yeah, us. Absolutely. OK, okay so um, in all the reporting, uh, do you have a particularly favorite detail um, of uh, anything that you've you've dug up, either because it was uh, difficult to dig up or it was entertaining to dig up, or you just like it? Yeah. Well, in this recent story, I think the uh, probably our favorite detail was we found these pictures that we published from the Scalia papers, where on this this fishing junket, uh, where again. Uh, another undisclosed uh, free, apparently free va fishing vacation for Justice Scalia, transport by private jet by this other businessman and Federal Society donor. Um, they went on a chartered boat as part of this trip to see the Hubbard Glacier up in Alaska. And uh, the, the boat's captain, um, uh, you know, went up to an iceberg and, and um, chiseled off some glacier ice. And then we have a picture of Scalia mixing glacier ice martinis. Um, and actually, after the story was published, somebody sent us another picture, uh, uh, probably taken a few minutes after the one we did publish, in which uh, Scalia and the businessman are, are actually drinking the martinis, which, uh, if you want to see, it's on uh, Josh Kaplan's Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, I feel like there's, there's some kind of metaphor or, or symbolism here, but I'll, I'll let somebody more poetic than me figure out what it is precisely. Well, these are uh, men who uh, enjoy the great outdoors and the uh, um, the unspoiled wilderness. Um, and whether that comports with their uh, jurisprudence is uh, a question that we can leave for the, uh, the viewers. But um, I guess the last thing that I'd ask you then is, uh, what cocktail would you make with Glacier Ice? <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, I think I would probably do, you know, this is a, bo a boring choice, but maybe a gin and tonic. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> How about so you? Ba so basic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I go with a gimlet. Okay. You know? um, I'm a gimlet <laughs> guy. Um, all right, Justin, thank you. Okay. I think it's Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much to uh, everybody who's uh, listening, attended, asked. Uh, questions and comments. We really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate uh, the tips um, and uh, we run on donations. So um, we particularly uh, appreciate small dollar donations from uh, regular readers. So thank you very much for the support. Bye everyone.